Today, we're here for a webinar called Sustainability Will Be the Driving Force Behind This Decade's Biggest Innovations. We have a fascinating panel, experts from, uh, from Hitachi, Intel. Of course, I'm from Clean Technica, Zach Shahan, CEO of Clean Technica. Uh, just as a quick short intro, sustainability is moving from a nice to have to a strategic imperative that is improving business performance, reducing costs, building resiliency, and mitigating risks while energizing employees and customers from decarbonization of data centers and supply chains to deploying renewables and electrifying fleets. There are plenty of opportunities to go green and see business benefits, but what are companies working on specifically to advance sustainability and how can they think about the right approach for them? So right now we're going to get a lot of in-depth insight on this matter. I would say just generally, this is a, it's a hard matter to, to put in a, in a headline or an abstract, and it's hard to kind of summarize it in a way that, ex, that sort of shows how, how interesting and deep it, it can be. But talking with, with Justin, Simon, and Jamie beforehand, uh, pre preparing for this webinar, I found a lot of fascinating new stuff in there. Even after 15 years of covering this stuff, I found a very, very interesting insight into what's happening now and in the near future or the coming decade. Um, so the plan here is that we're going to have a little intro on, on each of our panelists. Uh, we're going to have a little short summary uh, slideshow on the broad topic, and then we'll get into some more detailed questions and answers. Uh, to, to start with, aside from myself, as I said, CEO of Clean Technica, hopefully you know who I am. We have Jamie Bellevue, Sustainability Director of Data Center and AI Business Unit at Intel. Jamie has been a passionate advocate for climate action and renewable energy for decades. After spending time in semiconductor manufacturing, uh, which is quite, quite a useful thing to be in right now, he followed his passion into the renewable energy industry in 2007 and then joined Intel in 2017. Jamie leverages his intimate knowledge of solar energy, project finance, cloud compute, computing, and artificial intelligence, all the buzzwords, to guide Intel's overall sustainability strategy and his passionate advocate for empowering industry to help solve climate change. Uh, we also have Justin Bean, solution and strategy innovation, sustainability and ESG expert at Hitachi Global Social Innovation Business. Justin furthers the mission of building a more sustainable society through technology and business innovation. Justin has worked with both Silicon Valley startups and Fortune 500 companies that are applying AI, IoT, and other disruptive technologies. More of those same uh, all the buzzwords. Tech buzzwords that we all love. <laughs> it makes me perk. Oh, oh, yeah. He has worked internationally on projects that include smart cities, electric vehicles, wow. renewable energy, computer vision, smart spaces machine learning and IOT solutions. He was a recipient of the Think Prize for the Financial Empowerment Challenge from renowned innovation and design from IDEO and holds an MBA in sustainable management from Presidio Graduate School in San Francisco. And we have Simon uh, Ware, head of portfolio management and product marketing at Hitachi Energy Grid Integration Business. Simon joined Hitachi in 2016. So if you're keeping track, that's one year one year before Jamie joined Intel and holds various positions in consulting and project management in global organizations. He has extensive experience of leading global portfolio and marketing activities for a wide range of solutions in both the energy and the mobility sector. So it's nice again that we have all, of, all three of our panelists have experience across that spectrum, which we always love. And he has a master's degree in mechanical engineering from ETH Zurich, ETH Zurich, and is a dual citizen of Switzerland and Germany. So I think uh, to get going from here, I will have I will let you both uh, let you, all three of you. Sorry, um, just give one more word. You know, short snippet on what brought you into this, your background, and um, and what what you're looking to do in your in, in your career going forward. Just sh sh short snippet on those very broad large topics, starting with Jamie. Okay, uh, thanks, Zach. Um, what brought me into this? I, you know, I, I have to give some credit to my parents here, uh, both of whom are uh, very nature focused. I, I grew up spending, you know, most of my childhood outside, you know, climbing trees, uh, riding bikes, getting dirty, doing all those fun things that, that kids do. But really from 
an early age had, you know, instilled within me uh, a deep appreciation uh, for, for nature and, and for the earth. I think I wrote my, my first uh, climate change related paper back in the uh, 90s in, uh, in high school. And it's, it's been a passion of mine ever since. So uh, really appreciate the pleasure to um, you know, be here today. Thank you to Clean Technica and to Hitachi for making this happen and, and looking forward to learning a bit more with uh, all of my co-presenters. I like, I think similar, you know, as a kid got into this and I, I think it's, it's fun to see that those of us who have been in it for so long, we've gone through all these different industries and topics. And so it's, it's nice to be able to have a robust conversation. Uh, Simon? Yeah, that sounds pretty similar. Um, I think like um, 18 years ago, you would have probably seen me as a climate activist with much longer hair, um, really being active at the front. Um, I think I've chosen a different path then, uh, cut my hair and, um, and now try to influence it through the corporate route. And I mean, honestly speaking, there's so many people speaking about 2050 um, ambitions and uh, that seems far away and it is, but I've, I've actually recently found out that that is roughly the year in which I retire. So it sort of gives me a career goal, right? It's not just achieving net zero for the society, but it's like, if I manage to do my career well, then I can contribute that by that time I retire, we actually arrived at net zero um, and potentially earlier. <laughs> Let's, that sort of gives me my compass. Yeah, 18 years ago, you could also find me with long hair, probably in the same activist circle as, as Simon. <laughs> Uh, Justin. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, which is surrounded by a lot of hiking trails and nature and, uh, you know, always loved going hiking and camping with the family. We had, you know, a dog and five cats and I volunteered at a local animal rehabilitation center when I was a kid and just was, you know, really in touch with how wonderful it is to be in nature and how important it is and, you know, enjoying the company of our animal friends. And then as I grew to be an adult and got involved in business and studying economics and things like that, I, I realized that there needed to be some kind of synthesis between the ways that we approach our own civilization and the ecological systems within which we all operate, right? We, our economy is dependent on an ecology and we must be able to reconcile the two to keep this whole thing going, which is, which is beautiful, right? The human civilization is a beautiful thing. Nature is a beautiful thing. How do we uh, create a path forward for us to live in harmony and, and just to be able to continue um, at, at worst and at best to, to thrive and, and really take advantage of, of both. Thank you all. Um, and Justin, I think we're, we're going to have a short slideshow from you to kind of uh, do an overview of this topic. It's a very broad topic and we're going to get into some nuts and bolts, but uh, we, we try to get a good overview first to get everybody on the same page. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. I'll just share a, a few slides for about five minutes here. Um, but yeah, I think if you you ask 100 people what sustainability means, you probably get 500 different answers, right? So it's important to kind of think about it through our own lenses, but really think about, you know, the, the topic of this conversation and the title of the webinar, which is really around the opportunity and the imperative of sustainability. So if we look at uh, the environment within which business is operating, it's actually very different than in the traditional sense. So there's increasing regulatory pressure, there's increasing uh, consumer pressure, uh, they demand sustainable product services and, and companies that they work for, for example. There's also all kinds of rising risks environmentally and socially with the destabilization that can happen when climate change advances. Um, and But what's really exciting is that solving all these problems is a massive opportunity for startups, for big companies, and for people who want to get involved. In fact, uh, I think we all remember the CEO of BlackRock saying the next thousand unicorns are actually going to be in climate tech. So this is a big opportunity, and we can all focus our careers on doing something really meaningful here. And, and so again, kind of thinking through a framework of, of how this sort of thinking has evolved, we went from this uh, old school kind of view of the competition between business and sustainability, right? Making a business impact or sustainability impact. And then that evolved into reducing risk, which we all know is out there. And then we found ways of making businesses more efficient and started seeing that this could help us to reach our KPIs better and be more efficient at it. Uh, and then we started talking about cost reductions, right? That actually by being sustainable, and finding more sustainable materials and services, you weren't 
just reducing the risk of your supply chain, but you could reduce costs and actually improve your, um, your bottom line. And, and now we're sort of emerging into the space where actually there is a ton of new opportunity for new businesses, new revenue models, and what I like to call green blue oceans, right? There, there's all this innovation potential that's out there to solve this problem and many other sort of social problems that, that we're all dealing with and we all face. And so a lot of these organizations agree. So BCG is a, a leading consulting firm uh, and they see this in a really interesting way. So it used to be this thought of social responsibility was outside of the organization, but they found organizations were starting to integrate social impact into their core business. And not only were they doing it, but those who were integrating sustainability and social impact into their core business had better, not only social returns, but shareholder returns. Uh, higher margins, higher valuation potential or uh, multiples, more innovation internally, they retained uh, their employees better, all kinds of new ways that uh, this was helping them. And so in a more recent report, they and the World Economic Forum found similar things that there were so many different benefits for businesses from uh, saving carbon and cash, right? But that also led to lower regulatory risk, like we talked about, cheaper financing, higher values, better retention. And then also when we look at the markets that they're operating in, traditional markets are actually growing much slower than sustainable markets. So if you look at the bottom right chart here, those in the dark blue are the traditional markets in the same sectors. And then the green alternatives are actually growing at a much higher rate. So this is a really strong business opportunity. And so at Hitachi, we see this as an opportunity, not only internally for us to improve our own sustainability, which we are, we have net zero targets by 2030, uh, targets for 2050. And we're also comping our highest executives pay based on their uh, performance against those metrics. So Hitachi has taken some great leadership, but we also want to help our customers and partners to achieve sustainability as well. So PwC did this great framework going from uh, going along this maturity path from compliance and what you must do all the way through finding uh, efficiencies, taking leadership, and then creating new value and new purpose. So Hitachi has immense capabilities as an $85 billion company with 872 companies underneath that umbrella uh, to be able to provide our customers and partners with solutions along that along that path. And so that's what we're really passionate about. And uh, we're, we're happy to help and looking at a lot of different areas. Uh, and so one of the areas that we think is interesting among some of the others that we'll talk about today are, are data centers. And so data centers are actually uh, growing really rapidly. And of course, everything that we do is becoming more and more data driven. And also data is taking different shapes and forms. Uh, it's not just ERP systems and databases, but all of the internet of things and artificial intelligence and now blockchain coming online. Uh, all of these are increasing the demand for data and the need for us to have data centers that support that. So today data centers are actually responsible for about as many emissions as the global airline industry, which is pretty enormous, but that's growing very rapidly to reach about 14% of emissions by 2040. Um, now we can debate some of these numbers. Some data centers are becoming more efficient. This idea of green data centers is emerging and we'll talk more about that. Um, but the, the point is that we need to get to that space where we're, we're greening our, our data and our data centers. We, we think about greening supply chains with physical materials, um, but we need to think about the data supply chain as well and how we, how we green that. Um, so I'll stop the slideshow there, but maybe we can jump into the conversation and, and talk about the next, the next part. Yes, uh, just a couple of notes. Um, so we do want to also thank Hitachi for sponsoring this webinar. Very appreciated. And uh, if anyone has questions, put them in the Q&A section of the Zoom uh, webinar, not the chat section, which it's easier to answer the Q&A. Um, to move on to the first question for me, what's happening with sustainability within your respective organizations and how it has ESG risen in prominence? Uh, Justin, you just presented on this, but do you want to say anything else about Hitachi uh, before passing it along to Simon and Jamie? Uh, I guess just really quickly. Um, yeah, we have a lot of our own sustainability targets internally, and that spans from our rail business that's building, building bullet trains to a power business that's building all kinds of energy solutions to you know manufacturing. We make you know, 30% of a Toyota Camry hybrid, for example, right? So we're thinking through all of those different parts, but also how do we help the market 
to become more sustainable through our mission of social innovation. Um, and so it, it really is great to see an organization to take it very seriously and, um, and see the opportunity, not only internally, but for the rest of the market uh, in this business. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and let the others speak. So I assume that's not the tires on the Camry hybrid. No, <laughs> no it's not the tire. Yeah. Simon, do you want to uh, add a bit more from your perspective on what's happening at Hitachi? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> just for the background, I mean, I'm part of the one of the joint ventures between Hitachi and ABB, which is Hitachi Energy. Um, it's 80% Hitachi, so it's we're, we're already a good part of the family. Um, and we are focused solely on providing um, any sort of infrastructure for electrifying um, any sort of application, right? Um, be it from the generation down to where the consumption points are. And we strongly believe that any sort of decarbonization path um, in the in the coming decades will have a fundamental element of electrification because this is really what brings us away from burning fossil fuels and etc is like electrifying those processes where possible right and i think this is where we see a strong contribution just purely from the from the product contribution that we make from the solutions we provide um, that help in all those directions, be it hardware or software, um, that goes in this direction. And I mean, on what comes on top is that within this, and this is maybe when when we speak about how ESG environmental performance has risen in our in our uh, latest years from a customer perspective as well, is that it's not enough to just electrify it these days. Also, customers are looking to minimize their carbon footprint in the infrastructure they build. And we have some topics there, like be it some, some of the isolation, uh, insulation gases, uh, fluorides, and so on, that we try to reduce and we find cleaner solutions for this as well. And there's plenty of customers who do actually in their tender processes also evaluate footprint, carbon footprint. And, and this really drives um, the entire organization in this direction now. So that's pretty interesting to, to observe. Yeah, I almost highlighted that myself earlier. You know, it, we see we the announcements about 100% renewable energy for the Stater Center or that company or whatever are great and interesting, exciting. They they're good for headlines. People like them, but um, but you know, getting to, you know making the all components, all the supply chain of these massive places uh, greener, more efficient, is obviously a, a very important part of the part of the story. Um, and yeah, I mean, Simon, you're. Uh, German Swiss, so you must have connections to ABB. It's like part of this part of this national requirements. Uh, Amy, uh, what can you tell us about Intel? Moving on to Intel now. Intel's a huge corporation as well. Uh, we we write about it on various topics, but what can you tell us on these on these broad topics? Yeah, I mean, I you know, just similar to the comments by Justin and Simon, uh, we see it as just a rapidly growing. Uh, pillar of you know critical focus for our business both on the client side of computing and also uh, on the data center side of computing moving forward I can go all the way back to you know Gordon Moore and Moore's law in 1965 you know the doubling of, of transistors and the you know just mission of Intel over the past uh, what is it seven or five decades six decades of uh, continuing to drive the efficiency of compute, being able to do more with less, right? Which is a key tenet of uh, the concepts of, of sustainability, energy efficiency. Um, and now uh, I, we see it everywhere from, you know, uh, our usage, our pro proliferation of our usage of renewable energy to power our facilities. I think we're, we're at 82% uh, right now, which has been a huge undertaking uh, for, like you said, a, a 200 plus billion dollar company with facilities around the world, all the way down to what can we do actually on silicon uh, in the data center to either help companies like Hitachi and our OEM partners design more efficient compute platforms to leveraging the latest version of a Xeon processor in the most compute efficient way uh, and, and everything in between. So lots of interesting topics to talk about. I don't want to take up uh, too much time, but it, we're at the point now where it's it's touching almost almost every aspect of our business. Yeah, and I, I like that actually. The I, we we have these goals, hundred percent renewable energy, but then you also have these growth goals, and you're growing very rapidly. And it's very hard to meet these sustainability <laughs> goals as you're meeting growth goals. And I mean, 
I wasn't planning to bring it in, but you think of Tesla, which has had the goal of 100% renewable energy giga, gigafactories, and they're still not close to that. And that's the whole biz. I mean, that's the whole biz- mission of the business. You know, so it I, it always is a little bit like uh, intriguing how you balance those challenges of growth and decarbonizing. Do you want to just a few more? It, you know, it's a really astute point. It's a, a real challenge. Um, you know, for us in the coming years. Uh, you know, our, our new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, has been very vocal about our desire to engage in um, a foundry business model. We're, you know, rapidly ramping uh, manufacturing capacity. We've made some recent announcements in Ohio here in the U.S., um, Germany, Italy, and other countries uh, in the EU. And I lost my automated lighting. See, this is energy efficiency at work right here. <laughs> the, the lights in the room went out. <laughs> so um, absolutely, uh, I think the growth we can expect Zach won't be perfectly linear. Um, there will be some, you know, lumpiness, right? So as we're building uh, new facilities, we're going to have to work with the local regions um, where we're building them to make uh, renewable energy and other sus- uh, sustainable technologies uh, available. I see uh, your strategy. Just, keep, just keeping us in the dark about what Intel's uh, doing. Oh. <laughs> no, sorry, sorry. Very serious. Serious. I'll be back. We, we appreciate the energy efficiency. We'll let you uh, get your lights back on. Uh, we were going to go to you first on the next question, but I'll go to, um, to uh, Simon. Uh, so let's, let's talk about policy and pressure points and how these play a role in yeah. this de- decarbonization efforts. Uh, what's the high level view at Hitachi and, and also at Intel when, when Jamie's uh, there? I'm, I'm looking at my, my notes now, so I don't know if he's in the light now. What market pressures are you seeing that are impacting sustainability related decisions? And what are the steps being taken to leverage existing technology to achieve that? Um, yeah, and, and what's the, the policy uh, angle on that? I'm not asking you to get into the weeds on policy items on the table anywhere, but sort of to help in the decarbonization effort. Jamie okay, has his lights back on. Okay, so. we can. We, 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 Jamie. <laughs> Uh, Jamie, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I was too busy getting like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think. Uh, well, I already commented on on the is not going to be linear, right? Um, but from a technology perspective, you know, absolutely. Uh, people's aspect of our business, at least, is the partnership that. We have to with companies like Hitachi and others using this, um, to make sure that you know, take the most out of them every day, but also just um, at a fundamental level, creating the next generation of what we're going to bring. Or it's at the edge, in the center, in the network, or or anywhere in between. Um, and I think you know, you know we've seen in some industries you sometimes have the CEOs uh, just swinging for stronger policies they're like well we can't really compete we can't do anything if there's not a policy that pushes us to do it because then we're at a disadvantage so there's the policy there's you know there's the 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 sort of it's, it's such a vast question but you know the kind of what kind of policy pressures are are pushing on intel that are helping it in in its path to decarbonization and also maybe you know like you said market pressures i mean more and more consumers want to see that the company is is really decarbon is green and and i i think you know even have gotten a lot smarter in like what you know uh watching out for for green greenwashing and kind of delineating okay this company talks a lot but this company is doing a lot you know so i don't know how do you feel that impacts intel's path yeah i i I, the most direct one that i can think about um immediately that comes to mind and maybe this is you know partially because of my background in renewable energy is just um the regulation or deregulation of electricity markets is a great example where the average homeowner doesn't really think about that in a regulated uh, environment because they only have one choice for where their utility uh, company uh, that, that, that they can use for their house or their business, the bill is going to come from the same person it always has. Um, and in a regulated market, uh, you know, renewable energy proliferation uh, is sometimes a bit more challenging than, than say in a deregulated market like Texas, for example. Uh, where you can be more creative um, with what you do with the background financial and economic structures. Uh, so that's, that's one example where it's just almost completely out of control of any kind of private entity. Um, we do our best. And if we 
we don't have the support of the region that we're operating in, then we have to uh, conquer the challenge in, in another way, uh, say with unbundled renewable energy credits as a, or an offset, which is you know, still uh, fantastic forward progress, but maybe not the, the optimal solution to the problem at the end of the day. Yeah, I know a lot of people in Western Europe also find it, ba- you know, surprising that you don't just be able, that there's not all this competition between electricity providers and the ability to, to choose greener ones. Um, Simon, do you want to chime in on that sort of question as well? The policy pressures as well as the market yeah. pressures that are pushing Hitachi to to yeah. do more or maybe not pushing you enough. I don't know how, how you view it. As I actually just just to, in brackets, so it's actually funny that um, that you say that Western European supply uh, consumers have a different view on this. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm living in Switzerland and we also don't have a fully liberalized power market, right? So I I also not, don't get to choose my my provider. I just get to choose between variants of how much green energy I have within my tariff, right? That's interesting. I mean, but. Um, so there's at least some direction um, that, that you can take as a consumer, but in the, in the wider sense, there's <laughs> potential for more liberalization, right? Um, but that said, I mean, the, I think the political pressure at a high level and, and sort of the direction is relatively clear. I mean, if you, um, if you look at the European context now, I mean, with Fit for 55, which aims at a 55% reduction by 2030 of carbon emissions in the European Union, I mean that's that's pretty pretty close, right? 2030 is not like one lofty 2050 goal. That's actually something where you, we need to act now, and this um, really puts a lot of um, I almost say positive pressure um, in in terms of the high level direction of where, where we are trending towards. It also gives an indication of not everything can be from totally innovative solutions, right? I think, and there is studies around also that that sort of try to make an assessment of how much can we already achieve with existing solutions and it's surprisingly high that share right it's it's almost in in many areas it's more a question of the economics and the incentive structures rather than the the latest innovation that we need right um that's quite interesting um and i think this is where Sometimes the last mile of politics is, is missing. Um, and I could think of, just to give an example, is uh, I think we have good incentives to increase the share of renewables in, in, the, in the grid, right, for, for, from an electricity market perspective. But what is not yet fully there, and where all market participants are sort of trying to find their way of how they make an economical beneficial model of it is how do I actually manage the ancillary services? So how do I manage grid storage, energy storage? How do I manage um, voltage stability? All those things that are somewhat not just providing sheer power to the grid, but really giving economic benefits to those who, who warrant the power quality and security in a system with a higher share of renewables. That's a market that has existed for a while, um, but it's still not there to, to really work with 80, 90, 100% of renewables. And we should start thinking of how that looks like so that people can really start making their investment plans towards this. Yeah, 100%, Simon. I'll just say as you know, a, a corporation that <clears throat> survives on the output of factories, uh, that's absolutely critical and something that you know, doesn't get talked about enough, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and I guess I'll throw in from just the, you know, American policy perspective too. that. I mean, the writing's on the wall, right? Whether you're in the Americas or Europe, you don't know exactly what it'll look like, but there's a lot of emerging policies. I mean, the SEC announced that they're going to have a requirement around reporting, right? And there's the um, Corporate Climate Accountability Act that is on Governor Newsom's desk in California. So this would require any business over a billion dollars doing any business in California will have to report all scopes of its emissions, scopes one, two, and three, right? And so that that is going to be a huge requirement for these companies that need to start thinking about, how do I even do that, right? Today, it's very manual, right? They have to ha- have a team of people go through their production processes and everything else and their supplier network and try to figure out what the emissions are, not only for their own energy and not only from their own operations, but the operations and energy consumption and emissions of all of their suppliers that feed components into their into their system and raw materials. So um, better to get a head start today and figure out how you do that, right? And, and make it 
less manual, more automated in, in any case, and, and easier to report on and share across different groups. Um, I mean, what we often see is that the sustainability executives are sort of operating in the business world often. And then you've got the engineers and operational people who are on the ground just making sure that stuff is has high uptime and isn't shutting down, right? And, and so the sustainability may be lower on their list, but we need to find ways of bringing these groups together so that they can find ways of, um, you know, doing this without hiring, you know, another 25% labor force to, to report on it. And so I think some of the new technologies will help with that. Some of the, you know, existing technologies can be um, shifted to help in, in those types of reporting, but it's, it's clear that that's coming. I definitely, one of uh, Larry thinks, you know, next 1000 unicorns will be a company that helps, you know, all of us to solve that problem. <laughs> For sure. Hitachi's helping, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I definitely think, you know, we're at a, a stage where the the future is the future is now and we know it's, you know, we know it's clean tech, we know it's increasingly clean tech. Uh, one sector where that sort of hit a big disruption curve kind of recently in, in Europe is the electric transport sector, which now 20% of new new vehicles sold in Europe are have a plug uh, or a place to plug. Uh, and, you know, fleets are sort of a, on the on the cutting edge of that since there's so much you know looking at the, the total cost of ownership the the efficiencies gained there on a fleet fleet level uh, so there's opportunities to trans, transition you know diesel chugging fleets to, to electric and i know hitachi has been in talks with pence for example for this kind of thing uh, and uh, there's just opportunities growing throughout this the you know transit shipping uh, even aviation is getting uh, sort of interesting and, and exciting uh, can each of you share a little example, uh, some perspective on advances you're addressing in these sectors, starting with uh, Simon? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a little bit really a big area for us currently um, to grow in, right? I think the market, as you rightfully said, is, is really at an inflection point. Um, we might have seen 20% this year. We've seen below 10% last year. So it's really, this is what we call exponential growth. And I think many of us have now seen what exponential growth is, unfortunately, in, in lesser, uh, less beautiful contexts uh, with COVID. I mean, um, this market is going through an S-curve now. So this is, um, and, and this is what people need to prepare for when they um, build their charging infrastructure, because you don't just buy electric vehicles. You need to also worry about how you charge them and um, how you connect them to the to the grid and when you charge them um, and your utility your local utility will be very happy if you if you make some thoughts around that so that they don't have to build out their their local grid just uh, for the maximum use case and um, this is really an area where we are very engaged um, as you rightfully pointed out um, with some of the providers be it in the US and be it also in Europe um, on, on a couple of questions. One is, as I said, smart charging. So just making sure that you charge at the right point in time to not overload any sort of closed grid nodes, um, how I connect to the grid. And also, um, and that's a big topic for, for some of the um, bigger fleets that we see, fitting that charging infrastructure into existing infrastructure, right? I mean, there's plenty of people who have, who've built a bus depot, who've built a some some sort of truck depot in the, in the past and they don't want to just build a new depot so they need to be very in fit your infrastructure into thing so you don't have to rip it all off and build it and um in the direction of really reducing the footprint and there we have smarter from a grid emotion portfolio as we call it and uh, this is rolling out not very really exciting to, to see that happen. And do you have more commentary on what Hitachi is doing in this sector? These um, I think I think Simon did it really well, right? I mean, um, it's coming. A lot of these electric vehicles will be coming to fleets and transits and and all across the board. Um, but the first thing to think about is how are you going to supply power to them, and how do you need to upgrade the grid in your you know local setting to be able to provide that. And I think there's some, you know, organizations taking leadership on that, some different cities that are looking at these more distributed um, depots where they will charge at different times a day and then use some of the intelligence that Simon talked about to make sure that they're um, either 
using energy storage or intelligent software to charge at a time when the uh, power is cheap and, uh, and, and let it sit when it's expensive and or sell that power back to the grid when it's expensive and offset some of the costs that you've got coming in from, from that power. So I, I think it's, it's stimulating a lot, a lot of really interesting conversations around the business models and how this can be you know, lower cost and even generate revenue in some cases. Um, and how we can leverage the batteries that are sitting out there in all of those vehicles to maybe feed back into the grid, right? And do feed it, feed vehicle to grid or B2G, um, which I think with large fleets can help to uh, improve sustainability and power some of their systems and improve resiliency, which is another big question on the, the energy and, and um, electric vehicle side. I believe that, you know, all of us in this kind of generation, we've grown up with an emphasis on synergy and uh, integration and you know, whole systems views, because I think this is just, we can see how important that is at this transition. Uh, Jamie, Intel had a fascinating role in the vision sector, fascinating roles, uh, some more, uh, uh, get more PR behind that than others, I'm sure. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your perspective on Intel's role in, in this electrification of transport? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, Zach. It's, it's an exciting new area um, and one that I've spent some time on at Intel. But, you know, perhaps the most obvious thing that I saw was, uh, you know, before I could even afford an, an electric car, we had electric charging stations uh, at all of our offices and facilities. And I don't want to underscore, uh, I want to underscore the, the importance of that, right? And, and not just that, but we had the support of our local government here in relatively progressive California to give EVs access to the commuter lane, um, which if you've ever tried to get into Santa Clara, uh, you know, between the hours of, of 7 and 10 a.m. Uh, is, is very much appreciated. Uh, in fact, I, I benefited, you know, from that this morning. So just that's one way I think companies like Intel and others can help is just by increasing um, the build out of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. You know, we, we shouldn't skip over that. But maybe um, some more nuanced ways. Um, we talked, you know, last week about our Mobileye business unit as an example. When in the area of uh, sustainability, a lot of times we talk about embedded carbon and operational carbon. Um, well, there's a lot of embedded carbon in the manufacturing of a new vehicle, right? Um, and you know, I think uh, the future of vehicles is that a, a substantial, a substantially larger portion of the build cost of the vehicle is now compute, right? Your vehicle warns you if you're changing lanes at the wrong time and there's a car there. Your vehicle is able to stop if something you know, comes in front of, uh, in front of it and, and perhaps you didn't see it in time. These are all things that require um, computing products and obviously that's our, our industry. So a huge opportunity for us there and we're doing a lot of uh, partnering and investing. But also just the concept and of- it, it touched, I mean, Justin mentioned earlier how, how much, what was it, 30% you said of, of a- Camry hybrid has got Hitachi components. Yeah, so right. I, I assume Intel's got a similar kind of hidden, that made me think about how much, how much hidden Intel uh, hardware is in a computer, in, in a car, uh, let alone the, other, the software too. You know, I don't know how much. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. And just, uh, you know, uh, our mobile business unit working on progressing uh, autonomous driving capability. You know, once we get to the point where autonomy is real and there's some limited, you know, uh, geos around the US where that's today, um, we just won't have to build as many cars, right? I mean, you know, a car spends most of its life parked, right? Not, not driving. And especially in urban areas, uh, for sure, there's just going to be a much more efficient use of, of resources when we see uh, shared uh, autonomous fleets. And that's something that we're working heavily on, you know, both in the car, but also in the data center. Um, and on the AI, the underlying AI that makes that uh, possible, which requires a lot of computing power. Yeah, and I mean, something we've written about a lot, we've chatted a little bit on the side, Jamie, uh, the you know, autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, it's almost a given, I mean, it's a given in my perspective that they're electric. It's, it's just, it's not logical to not be electric for, for a large number of reasons. Many people in the industry have said this, this is not a, not breaking news, but I think it's important to remember, you know, Intel is one of the companies at the forefront with Mobileye of, you know, potentially achieving a level four, maybe level, level five someday autonomy. It's definitely in the top tier of companies that I always think about when I think about who's going to be, who's going to be first to really break the, the, the egg open on full, full self-driving robot taxis on a large scale. So, you know, 
if you do that, <laughs> you're going to be uh, doing it with electric vehicles, I assume. So that'll be a huge uh, shift in the industry. Um, so let's move on to a big topic that was introduced earlier, data center decarbonization. Um, we already had a, a good teaser on that, but Justin, do you want to say a little bit more about this this, this large, important, sometimes overlooked uh, area of the, of the industry? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess just to add to what I was saying earlier, right, that data is embedded in everything that we do these days and will continue to be more and more so. Um, and it will enable all kinds of new businesses and, and everything else. So I think we're all sold on the value of data. Um, but then when we think about, you know, the emissions coming from that, as I mentioned, it's, it's a lot. And so how do you think about decarbonizing the data center, right? Some of the hyperscalers are, you know, doing a great job of figuring that out. But let's say if you're, you know, you're a bank or an IT or telco or, you know, government with your own data center, how do you do that, right? And one major glaring example is energy. And I think Simon can probably speak to that, you know, much more intelligently than I can. Um, so basing your, your power on renewables is really important. But then when you start thinking about the actual operations of the data center itself, you need to have an understanding of how the uh, the hardware infrastructure is operating, um, how, the, how efficiently the applications are running on those systems, uh, how the HVAC systems and the cooling systems are working, and how do you be efficient about using those? And, and again, some of those questions around you know, storage and selling back to the grid and all of that come up. Um, and, and I think one of the areas of innovation is really just getting a sense of you know, what's happening, right? You can't manage what you can't measure. And so we're just getting to a point where we're starting to be able to measure the, the carbon footprint of the data center, right? A lot of data centers talk about power usage efficiency, but then we're also starting to look at, you know, renewable energy factors of those. And then, you know, like I said, the efficiencies of all the components. So, um, you know, one is being able to measure so you can manage it. And that involves many groups sometimes that operate different areas of the building, different systems within, within the building, your energy management system, your building management system, you know, the HVAC, everything else that goes into it, and then the actual components within the data center itself to understand uh, what emissions would be coming from each component and then which location, and, and then to be able to figure out how do you fine tune that to make it run more efficiently? And then how do you think about replacements, right? What are some of your old workhorses that you need to replace? And think about that you know, embedded carbon that Jamie mentioned. Um, so you replace it with something that's working better and, and you reduce your e-waste through, you know, responsible recycling programs. Um, so I think there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, so I think thinking about it in a, in a broader context about how you manage and operate the data center is going to be really important. And then how you communicate again between the sustainability, uh, teams and the data center operations and management teams is really important. And, it can be facilitated better with, you know, software platforms and, uh, you know, modern tools that we, we uh, leverage for these types of things. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, we can come back to Simon in a second. We'll put him on hold for a moment. Uh, Jamie, I'm sure Intel is all, also involved in decarbonization of data centers in a variety of ways. Can you talk a little bit about Intel's role on that front? Are you able to talk about so many different aspects of decarbonization? <laughs> I mean, I read your bio, but still. Yeah, for sure. And Zach, this is this is the one that's, I mean, I would say closest, you know, to me right now being in the data center business unit at, at Intel. So you probably have to um, give me the hook here if I if I talk too long. But, um, you know, Justin, I think, touched on most I'll all just, of them. I might just slap you virtually. Just, just go ahead. No, yes, no. just virtually <laughs> slap me. You know, I, I promise not to press charges. Um <laughs> Uh, and we won't take away any of your awards uh, that you may or may not win in 2022 as a result. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, this is this is a place where I just I feel like we're going to have a huge impact in collaboration with partners like uh, like Hitachi. Right. Um, Intel's, you know, Xeon CPU is uh, is the majority market share holder in terms of, you know, CPU that's powering the compute in, in data centers around the world, um, as Justin said, both on premises and also in the cloud. Uh, and so, you know, we, uh, we can get in there and get, you know, under the hood and really make sure that the work that's being done in the data center is being done as efficiently as possible, whether that's the workload itself, uh, the low level software optimizations, the operating system optimizations, promoting, you know, um, virtualization and containerization, 
Uh, and, you know, Justin, you mentioned this too. I mean, just you can't, uh, you can't manage what you don't measure. So we're looking forward to putting um, more telemetry on board in the CPU and the compute platform to enable us to do that more effectively. So these are all things I would say down at the very low level where we're uniquely qualified, you know, to engage with our partners and, and make a difference there. Um, but we're also looking at things that are a little more tangible, like immersion cooling, as an example, for the future where we can increase the power usage effectiveness of uh, efficiency, excuse me, of, of data centers um, through innovative cooling techniques that absolutely require, you know, our participation and certification, et cetera. That's going to be one to look out for uh, in the coming, uh, coming years. And you then just give you know, us a little more of a what is immersion cooling? What it, yeah, just literally just taking you know the compute platform and uh, and and immersing it in a liquid so that instead of a, a completely air cooled environment, um, you're leveraging you know the the higher uh, specific heat of of liquid to keep that compute. I was, platform. I was afraid you were going to say that. That sounds a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> it safe. It just don't safe. dip your finger in the water and you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's why, you know, it, it's really a collaboration. I mean, these are innovative new technologies that no one company can do on its own. And so we all have to come together to make that uh, a reality. And we've got, you know, people working on that today. Very, very smart people, um, you know, all the way out to I'll say, and you mentioned this briefly, like I think, you know, Amazon Web Services and Microsoft, you know, two fantastic partners of ours as well were the largest buyers of uh, renewable energy PPAs, you know, in 2021. And this is a, a, an area that we're also involved in for our facilities. Um, and these companies, you know, ourselves included, have to continue to look at ways to invest in the renewable energy ecosystem to help them to show up um, with enough renewable energy uh, kilowatt hours, you know, to supply the demand that's going to be created um, through the increased, you know, uh, proactive measures and regulatory requirements, right? So, you know, it's, it's really from, from like one side to the other. It's, it's very, very exciting. And, and finally, I'll just say that um, it's one thing to say that you have purchased enough renewable energy to offset the usage of a data center. It's another thing to say that it's operating 24-7 uh, on clean energy. And that's um, a very, very complex problem that requires collaboration between the utility company itself the data center owner and the computing that's happening inside of that data center. All those things have to come together uh, for that to be a reality. And, and we've certainly got our work uh, cut out for ourselves there. Yeah, I think we can move to the energy guy now on this. Uh, so, you know, obviously we want 100% renewable energy for this stuff. Simon, can you give us a little more uh, perspective on how large and small consumers can get a bigger share of renewables uh, for the energy supply? Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> it's exactly right. right? So the, the current way of how I usually get to my 100% renewable electricity is to buy a PPA and maybe just to unwrap that. That's a power purchase agreement. So I'll buy with some asset owner who has a renewable asset somewhere operating in the country, usually within the same electricity grid. Um, and I buy the rights to that production. Um, but we know how electricity works. It's not that I can decide that I only want the electrons that come from that windmill and the top north of the US uh, in my data center, right? So it comes through a grid. And that is, um, if I look at that, uh, a, a big question, and we're back to the regulatory question here, right? I mean, am I, am I just allowing everyone to buy PPAs wherever they are? And... Um, what does the grid do in between, right? The grid somehow has to manage these, these increased flows and maybe even the delocalization of where generation happens, maybe in some wind-rich, solar-rich uh, destinations versus where the data centers maybe sit or the, the other large consumers. And funnily enough, in, in Europe, for instance, some of those data centers sit where it's rather on the cold side because that's good for the cooling, right? not necessarily where the sun shines. So um, there's really a question of how, how do I manage the grid flows? Um, and I'd say that for a larger consumer, that's obviously a bigger question than for a smaller consumer. And some, the smaller I am, the, the more I can already today um, be also uh, thinking of putting batteries on, on, my, on the side of my data center that sort of can balance some of those those flows, right? But if I'm a hundred megawatt uh, plus data center, 
um, buying a battery that can keep me running for half an hour will cost me a fortune, right? At, at least at current battery prices. And yes, now with current prices, we see a, a, a short um, uh, uplift in battery pricing, but I think in the end, we'll, we'll land on a battery cost curve that will still go down and, and the, the economics will change. But I think that's where, we, where we're sort of going, that, that if you want to claim that you're a full renewable energy player, that you'll also need to contribute in some way or another to the grid stability and resiliency. Um, and I think that's the question of how do I get my power and how to, can I claim that I'm using 100%. There is obviously also some efficiency tricks that we can play. And I just want to mention one. Um, and it's really at the very corner of, of leading technology, right? I mean, when we look at data center efficiency and electric efficiencies, we're already super high, right? There's not much losses, but we're really optimizing to the edge. And, and what we're, what's currently kind of looked at, in, if we're thinking of next tech, is actually direct current microgrids, for instance. And that sounds, again, like a tech techy statement. But if you think about it, it's pretty simple. I mean, uh, Jamie's CPUs consume direct current. <laughs> Batteries are direct current. Many of the consumers and production, solar cells, solar PV produces direct current. Actually, a lot of things is in direct current. And we've just established a system where we usually transmit and distribute energy in alternating current. But if we can skip that step and really do direct current distribution, we, we have another efficiency gain. It's in the single digit percentages. It's not massive, right? We're not losing tons of energy every day on the grid. But if you want to get to that last, last element, then this is something that we can think about. And that's something that needs collaboration across again. <laughs> so it's, it's a Sound good stuff. Uh, we've got some audience questions. We're going to go ahead and get, uh, start asking. Uh, one is, I think, is meant to be private, but the, the first part, um, we'll send it along. But the first part, Justin, is Hitachi investing in new companies with patent, patented technology? I assume that's a yes or... <laughs> Yeah, we do have a ventures group, uh, Hitachi Ventures, that looks at uh, startups and new technologies that they would invest in. But there's also, you know, partners and and all kinds of groups around the world that we work with to, you know, do a lot of the things that we're talking about in this in this uh, webinar. So um, there's a more individualized part of that that we'll send along as well. Okay. Uh, and we have some of your pitch uh, deck. We'll check it out. Yeah. The the EROI. Uh, energy return on investment ratio of five should be a goal of energy production systems. Is this a commonly discussed metric other than the energy sector? Is there a metric to, to measure the efficient deficiency of, of other activities? What is that a commonly discussed target metric for you guys? I've heard of it, but Simon, maybe I'll defer to you. <laughs> I, I would actually have to hypothesize. Um, I think uh, what's meant is whether I get five times the energy back of what I put in a renewable asset, for instance. And I think that was a topic um, at some, and it's always good to have the back back up to that question. But I think we're now really speaking of uh, everything has become so much more efficient that if you put up a solar solar PV um, installation usually recoup that energy um, in investment within a year max. And yeah. for a wind turbine, it might be too. But if you look at the lifetime, I think we're far beyond an ERI of five. If, if that is what, what's behind ERI. I'm not yeah, if it's, a, if it's a measure of like the, embedded, <laughs> the embedded energy to how much is produced over the useful yeah. life. I think, at least from my experience in renewable energy, I, I agree with Simon that we're well, well beyond that with all the even existing uh, technologies, for sure. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. What are your thoughts on utility scale gravity batteries like Energy Vault? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I, can, I can maybe <laughs> take a first shot at that. Okay. Um, I'll leave it to you. This is all yours. <laughs> just for if anyone knows what, what's behind this. So this is really a concept. It's from Switzerland, actually, the company Energy World. And they are using suspended loads from a huge crane. Um, and they basically, when there is energy coming in, they lift the, the loads. And when they need energy, they drop the loads in a controlled mash fa fashion. And if you look at pictures, just type it into whichever search engine you prefer. And um, I, I must say, I, I'm still at the level of skepticism. I mean, they, this is huge constructions for um, actually little energy contents. Um, 
you need all that concrete, by the way, in terms of the loads. So I don't know whether anyone has put that into the there. equation. Concrete is usually not that cool from a con from a carbon footprint perspective. But actually, oh, sorry, there, there is efficient. I think I've, I've watched a couple of analysis which came to the point, guys, there is more efficient ways of storing energy and they are known as like batteries. <laughs> so um, yeah. the question I'm, says I'm not yet they, fully sold. They yeah. use compressed dirt, not concrete. But that actually leads to another question here, which is uh, what are your thoughts on sustainable cement and concrete industry, which is a big, uh, big co cause of emissions. Um, any comments on what's happening in that industry, Jamie? Justin, uh, you know, it's actually something I dug into a little bit a few weeks ago, and I I'm not pretending in any way to be an expert on this. Although I'll say that if, you know, the, the construction of a semiconductor fabrication plant, as an example, requires, um, you know, industry leading tolerances and precision in every aspect, I think if the products were available and, you know, I'm actually here at a, a climate conference today, I'm, I'm sensing a theme um, we just had some speakers from Microsoft and other companies that uh, there's just not enough supply of some of these solutions out there um, to satisfy the demand that could be there. But if, if the supply, you know, uh, was there, that certainly it, it would be considered. But again, um, and, and I'll reference another speaker who was a co-author of the recent book, um, you know, with John Doerr, um, Speed and Scale. We have to uh, achieve excellence in the replaced solutions, the climate aware solutions, so that consumers, companies, or, or, or individuals um, aren't making sacrifices to their core business or to their life when they're choosing an alternative, right? And so I think it's great if, if it's there and it's of the quality that is required um, and in the supply that is required. Yeah, that's why Jamie's in a in a little box with automatic uh, lights uh, surprising him because he's at a climate conference. I wasn't sure if that was uh, to be mentioned or not, but that's great. Um, one question here, energy resilience is critical to all nations, even more in the focus now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. How can the richer nations convince the developing world on sustainable decarbonized energy without widening the gulf in the immediate and near future? That's a big question for a whole webinar. I think that's, that's yeah, that's a fantastic but, question. Uh, I think that's yeah, the solution yeah. to world peace, actually. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. as well. It's a hard it's question. Tough. That's a very good question. Which yeah, I know, think it depends hard. on the country and depends on local politics and a lot of that. But um, I think there are probably some some good models of that where. Um, the financing solutions can be done in a way that are not predatory um, and can be sort of smoothed across some of the other sectors and kind of co-investing in innovation within countries and things like that to, to develop um, and, and use those energy supplies and that infrastructure to build a foundation for more economic progress and sustainable development can be a way to get there generally. But yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I I would just, a whole another webinar you know because this is something we focus on for 15 years i i think a lot of it often comes down to communication as well and helping people to understand that there actually are financial and economic benefits to this that are quick and immediate not just long term uh so that there is a lot of uh it's actually one of the first conferences i was speaking at was in crimea like a few months before uh it was invaded uh so i was, met a lot of great people there who were very hyper aware of the benefits of of uh localized decentralized energy clean energy and i think just sort of communicating that in as many ways as possible to as many people as possible in the in those um places is, is important i will have one in their own one, interest what's that and it's often in their own interest to have yeah. clean power yeah. and not be you know pushing yeah. soot in their children's lungs and healthcare system costs and all of that, like thinking about it holistically and from a systems thinking standpoint, I think will help us understand the impacts that the cheap, dirty energy is having um, to see the ROI as truly. And, and, the, and it's also hard. social benefits, Zach. It's, uh, you know, I just want to point this out. I mean, we do a lot of work with sustainable supply chain around the world. And some of that has led to um, collaborations with our customers in areas like the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we can actually bring um, clean, sustainable, distributed energy to communities there um, to improve, you know, the quality of life, especially of women and children. 
um, that then lead to increased business opportunities and you know a basic sense of greater self-worth and, and fulfillment um, for those people that are critical to you know our, our continuing health as a business. So it's it's certainly you know a very 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 important topic. And thanks to the person who uh, forced us to think about it. Yeah, and I love both of those things. I, I think it's really important to to communicate those. Uh, one more question uh, here on that topic. Actually, uh, manufacturing is always evolving, getting more efficient, more socially responsible, cleaner. Uh, but, you know, the supply chain is is a big part of the challenge of decarbonization. Uh, as we think about the future of industry, can you talk about the challenge and target of having full buy-in throughout the supply chain? We'll go to, um, well, we can go to, uh, Simon, Simon, we can go to you for this first and then go around the table. Yeah, and I, and I think it comes back to what I said initially, that really more and more companies, they know that part of their emissions and how they are measured. And actually, not just emissions, if you look at the whole spectrum of sustainability, other companies are being really under scrutiny for any sort of labor conditions or whatnot, right? I mean, there's pollution from, a, from an environmental perspective that you have to take care of. We're really getting more and more in, into, a, into a mode where, where there's enough scrutiny around this. And I think we still need to hit the right level of being over scrutinized um, versus uh, hitting the right levels, as we, as we said as well earlier, um, of just finding the right balance so that we do the right things. Um, but I think really throughout the supply chain, it's there's so many things that can always be optimized um and back that touches also upon the concrete and, and cement question i think we've been we've been used to build substations for electrical infrastructure into houses right and do that on site in in dirty conditions uh, site risks whatsoever and there is a tendency today to do that prefabricated so you sort of put everything into a container in a controlled factory environment and then just ship the container on site and really reduce a lot of the risks reduce a lot of the risky labor conditions and be clean because you use less concrete and, and don't ship around all that stuff so i think there's there's lots of improvement potentials all along the supply chain essentially yeah and, and yeah, I, I would just say we have this concept of drinking our own champagne, right? No one really likes eating dog food these days. Um, and, and so it's something that we're looking at internally. And then, you know, figuring out our scope three emissions from our suppliers is a huge challenge as it is for any big corporation with a, a large supply chain. And, and then again, producing solutions and working with our partners and customers to help them do that collaboration because that can be the hardest part, right? Asking all of your suppliers to send you a detailed report on their emissions. If that's stored in a spreadsheet somewhere, that's really difficult, but being able to have a platform where you can bring that in, have it third party operated, um, and then be able to verify that type of thing is, is really, really valuable. And I think those types of solutions will help us move this forward because it's the same, you know, the, I hate to sound like a broken record, but you can't manage what you can't measure, right? And I think we're yeah. in this meta stage of trying to measure what's going on so that we can do something about it and make supplier choices and, um, you know, start to influence that up and down the stream. Yeah, I'm 100% with Justin. I mean, for us, the upstream scope three, um, is very challenging. We have thousands of suppliers around the world. I'm part of Justin's upstream and Hitachi's upstream scope three. There's just no right now, um, as far as I'm aware, and we've been looking, um, you know, agreed upon standardized measurements for these things that allows, you know, corporations to show up and be fearless and transparent and consistent with the way that they provide information so that we can manage and, and solve the problem. So we're, we're pushing for that and, uh, you know, certainly appreciate any knowledge that anyone in the audience may have about uh, progress there. But that's that's the level that we're at. We've, we've got to see some progress there to, to facilitate things. Well, thank you all. This has been wonderful. I have one more question that I'm going to provide to all of you as homework and maybe we can get some written responses uh, since we've wrapped up our time here. But just as we think about 2022, perhaps five to 10 years Ahead, are you optimistic that companies will continue to adapt, be even more aware of their environmental legacies, and uh, and what are what is your near future and and me medium term future at your companies? Uh, so that's you know I'll put that in a in an email and we can get a kind of uh, 
homework answer from all of you and follow up as, as an article, a teaser for anyone listening. We'll have an article with that uh, as a response uh, as well. I think um be curious to see what you guys put together when you sit down and have to write it down. But uh, talking, talking. <laughs> but yes, easy. very optimistic. <laughs> but thank Thank you all. This is tremendous, uh, amazing insights from guys who are leading um, decarbonization at major corporations uh, around the world and all of the, the corporations above and below you that interact with you on this. So thank you for your insights. This is always what we crave and love thirst for here at Clean Technica. So I had a lot of fun. I'm sure listeners did as well. Us too. Great conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Zach, for leading us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.